all good. Is that better? Okay, fantastic. Good morning. How nice to be here. Um, this is my first trip to Poland, uh, and it's been a really good experience. I was warned that you would all be friendly and that the country was beautiful, and in fact, it's completely lived up to my expectations. Um, this morning, I'm giving a talk entitled Teach a Man to Fish, and it's a talk that's really about how we learn, how we keep growing, how we keep developing as professionals. You know, um, when you leave university, you have a great qualification, and in two years' time, none of that information is any use, because technology moves on so quickly, there's always something new to do. So in this talk, I'm going to talk a bit about um, how we can learn as individuals, and particularly in the con context of the teams that we work with. Um, for anyone who didn't meet me in the bar last night, which I'm not, I'm not sure there's anyone I didn't meet, um, <laughs> lots of people said hello. I'm Lorna, I'm a PHP consultant, uh, I'm independent. So um, I do lots and lots of different things. I'm based in the north of England. Um, and I do a variety of sort of development training, um, a book which I might mention later, uh, and a few other bits and pieces. So, Teach a Man to Fish, bit of a funny title for a talk. It's actually from a Chinese proverb. Um, Give a man a fish, you feed him for a day. Teach a man to fish, you feed him for a lifetime. And it's making the distinction between when somebody is hungry, you give them one fish, they have one meal, they're back to square one. And you teach them how to fish for themselves, and each day they can go out um, and find the next meal and the next meal, and so on. So what we're really looking for here is sustainable learning being able to take on something new and go out and take on the next thing and take on the next thing. We're not waiting for someone to give us a fish. So you're going to hear some sort of three different threads throughout this talk. We'll, we'll talk about you as an individual. We'll, we'll do quite a bit of that. We're going to talk about the team that you work in. And we'll also talk about the organization, the company that that team belongs inside. Uh, and I have some notes later for people like me who are self-employed. Uh, what we're looking for here is how to improve and how to keep improving, how to adopt habits and processes that will lead to us being increasingly more awesome over time. That's basically where we're trying to go. So we'll start off by talking about you. You are the sum of your skills and your aptitude, or your talent. So your skills are the things that you can do today. You already know how to do those things. You are confident if you are asked to do them at work. Um, your aptitude are the things you could easily do if you had the time to study or somebody showed you how to do it. Right? We're all capable of doing much more than we've already done because we haven't learned all of those things yet. There are some things you'll never do. Um, for me, that's mostly around um, HTML, CSS, anything visual. Uh, so, so website, my, my websites look great to me. Other people dislike four shades of purple. But <laughs> it's something that I, I don't have a talent for. Uh, and realistically, I will never be an expert in those areas. So that's where I really don't have the aptitude. No matter how hard I study, everything just looks great. Um, so before we <coughs> sort of start to improve your skills, we first of all need to understand where we are when we start. Now, this is like profiling an application. This is your benchmark. You can't say how much faster you made the application if you didn't benchmark how fast it was to start with. Right? You need to know what the improvement is. When we work with skill sets, this is exactly the same thing. Where are we starting from? Where are we today? How, are you, how do you measure that? 
And then where do we want to go? If we measure all the different skills for each person in each area in a team, what should that picture look like? Understanding what the requirements are, what kind of projects does your team do? What technologies do you need? Which ones does everybody need to be able to do? Which ones do you only do occasionally? Right? It, you have to understand and define what your desired team skills looks like, and then measure what you have. Now, traditionally, we, uh, we measure, I'm, I'm not sure what your local customs are, but certainly where I work in the UK, we measure skill by <coughs> usually a regular appraisal with your manager, and you sit down in a room with that person, and he or she tells you how well you're doing. And that's it. <laughs> that is truth. You have no way of coming back on that if you don't get on with the person, or they are not technical and do not understand your job and the challenges that you face. It's probably bad news. Um, so to measure skills within a team, you can take that approach. You can ask your senior developer or your manager to sort of say how good everybody is on each of the skills you're interested in. I don't really like this approach because I think that as developers, we are much better at evaluating the developers that we work with than our managers are. With apology to any managers in the room, they're just not that good at it. They're not doing this for a living. They don't understand the skills the way that we do. So I'm going to tell you about a technique that I use for doing this. It's called 360 degree feedback. So the idea is that instead of sitting down with your immediate manager, instead you are evaluated by people all around you in the organization. So we're looking for a specific set of criteria for your technical colleagues. They will be asked about your abilities in specific technical areas. For people elsewhere in the company, that might be the project managers that you work with, the support team, they may be asked questions that are more about soft skills and communication and whether you can actually fix things uh, and the, those kinds of things. The important thing is that you are evaluated by your manager, your peers, and anyone who reports to you. So if you have junior developers reporting to you, if you are a line manager, those people will have input into this system. Um, and I quite like it. Um, I think it's a really good way of giving, um, <clears throat> getting really balanced feedback. So if there's one person in the team who thinks you're useless, that's still going to balance out if everyone else can see that you're clearly doing a perfectly good job. So it takes away those kind of one-on-one -on -one, um, Personal conflicts is perhaps the best way to say that. So you get a really rounded picture, and you can average out kind of the overall view of how you were doing. Now, I use this approach in teams where I'm asking them to assess one another's competence in a number of different technical areas. So when you do this, you need to identify which areas you need skills in. Right? If somebody's awesome at juggling, that's still a skill, <laughs> probably not relevant to the job. You probably don't want it on this report. So which areas do we need skills in? And within that, which specific technologies, techniques, tools do we need skills in? What are we looking for? Then you assess everybody on that, and you put it together onto a chart so you can very easily see exactly where all those skills are. So, here's one I made earlier. This is a pretend chart. These are imaginary people. You might guess A, B, C, D, E down the side. Those are not real people. But this is an example of how your chart would look like. The areas where people are very well qualified are bright. Where they are less confident, they're a little bit darker, a little bit darker. Where the skill levels are quite low, we, you see those dark spots, the gaps on the chart. 
having a look at this team, you can see we've got people who are specialists, particularly in sort of front end or back end. Um, that's kind of a, a dark spot down here. That immediately rings an alarm bell to me. If I go into a team and they, when I generate their chart, it looks like this. Um, it's like, okay, so we're going to do some training on some of these areas, particularly where these numbers are quite low. And we're, we're going to do something big with this stack column, because only Anna really understands how the platform goes together. And um, in the industry, we talk about something called a bus factor. And this is the risk that um, Anna, your senior developer, goes out to get a sandwich for lunch and gets run over by a bus. Um, I have been threatening my colleagues with buses for many years. Um, <laughs> to the best of my knowledge, they usually become unavailable for work because they've gone to work somewhere better. Um, or something else equally nice has happened to them. As far as I know, no one has been run over by a bus, but it could happen. Okay? It's risky when the, all the knowledge on a particular area is concentrated in one person. You know, because they might go on a honeymoon for three weeks or leave the company to do a much nicer job or, you know, they don't necessarily have to get run over by a bus. But the risk is still there that that person will leave the team and there's no knowledge sharing. So understanding the skill gaps is quite important. And you may have gaps in your team for all sorts of reasons. Understanding that you do have gaps and, and what to do about those puts you streets ahead of most teams. Usually, someone leaves a team, you recruit someone with approximately the same skills. Really, if you take the time to sit down and evaluate what you have and what you need, you can go a really long way on the team that you have. Now, you may have gaps because somebody's left. You may have gaps because you've taken on a project that uses a new technology, so the desired chart of skills for this team has changed, but you are still the team that you were before that happened. So somebody is going to be moving into that area, getting into grips with that new technology, and sharing those ideas around the team. Um, skill, yeah, skills gaps can happen for all kinds of reasons. Knowing that they are there is not a criticism of the team. It's a position of power. It allows you to identify those and do something about it, move towards having a much more even team. Now, there's a few ways you can fill the gaps. The most obvious, perhaps the quickest way to do it, is to recruit. Um, <clears throat> and so if you have done this analysis of your team, what's the desired skill set? What have we got at the moment? We need to recruit. You will have a great idea of exactly which skill sets will be a nice fit for what you have already. Without this, you may not realize that, although you think you're employing um, a front-end specialist, if they also know a bit about Zen Framework, which is what your application is built on, that's going to help you a lot because you don't have a lot of skills in that area. If they already know how to use the deployment tool that you're hoping to implement, that's also a plus, and you may not pick that up without doing the skills analysis. The problem with recruiting is it can be quite expensive. So I don't know how the systems work here in Poland, but certainly where I come from, recruiters will take quite a lot of money to find you someone that you can employ. Lots of people nodding. Okay, yeah, you have the same thing. <laughs> um, and the cost of recruiting is not insignificant. I gave this talk for the first time at my home conference in Manchester in the north of England. And it's traditionally a place where there isn't a lot of spare money. And I think that's true in Poland as well. We don't necessarily want to throw money at recruiters to find us somebody. Uh, we may not be able to afford it. Small businesses, they don't have big margins. There have to be other ways to do this. One of my, if you do need to recruit, one of my favorite tactics is to offer a finder's fee, a recruitment bonus. So instead of paying the recruiter for having found a candidate, you can give quite a lot of money in 
in employee terms, to an employee that, that finds you somebody, that gives you a CV from their friend, someone they know at the user group, or something like that. As for the company, it costs much less than paying a recruiter. Um, for the employee, that's quite a good deal. I have, I have a friend who paid for his, um, like paid for a really big holiday by recruiting people off IRC <laughs> in, into the company I was working at at the time. But it's still cheaper for the company than paying the recruitment fees. And it's probably someone you know, and you probably want to work with them, and they will probably fit in with the team. They will still go through the same interview process as everybody else, but you don't have to pay the recruiters. So if you're recruiting and you don't have a finder's fee, have a chat with your business people, because I think it's a really good way to bring people in without paying those, those, those amounts of money. The most important word on this slide is risk. When you make those decisions, when you employ someone new, it's risky. And you can see here, risk is a multiplier. Something which is risky, if it goes wrong, will make the costs a lot bigger, right? If you make risky decisions, not just employment decisions, purchasing decisions, all of those things, the potential comeback is the cost can be very, very high. Now, we usually try to reduce or mitigate risk by, you can usually spend more money or more time uh, and reduce the unknowns, reduce the risk. In the example of recruiting, we might spend more time interviewing. We might give a phone interview and a technical test and an in-person meeting. I know companies doing personality testing to make sure they're not employing uh, psychopaths. Uh, <laughs> all kinds of different, all kinds of different things. But that's an investment of time, of money, to reduce the risk. So that when you're spending money on that employee and you've been through the signing the contracts, making all the arrangements, and spending a lot of time on them, you can be more confident that you've got somebody who's going to work um, quite well. Incidentally, risk is a really important concept in business. Um, Business people don't understand very many ideas. They do understand this one. Um, in projects as well, when you're estimating, there's an idea of risk. Is you know, if, if you're building a website about somebody selling some products, you may have done this several times before. But if they want it to, I don't know, send rockets to the moon. That's probably new technology for you, right, for a website. So you need to spend some time working out, mm, can we do that? Do we need to invest some time to reduce how risky that is? If you've ever had to integrate against a third-party API, which may not be documented, or indeed may not be built, um, <laughs> that, that's quite risky, right? Because you might know how long it ought to take, but how long it's really going to take you to get to the point where you're able to talk to their system coherently, uh, it can be a really long time. Uh, and in projects, we do something called a spike, where we spend time investigating that and try to reduce the risk. But that idea of risk is, well, it should take three days. Um, and for, for a task that you're confident about, it will take three days. And if you're integrating with somebody's third-party API, three months? Um, <laughs> how risky is it? Do you know the company? And so on. So that's a really important, important concept. How about not recruiting? How about not spending quite that much money? If you are not overwhelmed with work, if you don't right now have the budget for a new person, there are lots and lots of things you can do to fill your skills gap with the team you already have. Right? And this is in the, this is in the very idea of, um, living thriftily, of making something great with what there is to hand. Um, it, it's not throwing money at the problem. The power of not recruiting means that you will take your team and looking at that grid, remembering where the dark spots were, growing people's skills to cover the gaps yourself, making those middle-colored spots become bright spots, by investing in those people, 
and finding ways to let them grow their skills and make a bigger contribution to the team. And when I say people growing their skills, team members moving up a bit and moving into the gap, I don't mean the people you work with. I mean you. You're going to step up and make your skills better. You're going to learn the next new technology. And we're going to find ways that you can do this that will fit in with your work, will not cost too much money. Although, you know, if you work for a company that can send the whole company to Zencon, then great. Um, if you're not in that position, there's still lots and lots of things you can do. Um, and it's all about learning new stuff, learning new skills, putting yourself out and challenging what you already know and bringing more things into that basket of things that you already know. Um, one important thing to say here is that we all learn in different ways. So if you don't know which way you learn best, go on the internet. There are lots of questionnaires about learning styles. Some people learn very well from a video tutorial or screencast. I find them very difficult to interact with. Some people learn really well from books and articles. I'm all right if I'm really interested, but I find it hard to take in new technologies that I don't know how I would use them yet. For that, I really love to see people speak, to be at events, and to see someone who's really excited about that technology tell me why I should be excited. And that's to do with the different learning styles, the different ways that you take in information. There are loads and loads of resources available. Now, I'm going to run through a few. Hopefully, you all already have a feed reader. Um, I don't have any great um, advice on Polish language resources. If you have favorites of any of these in Polish, maybe you could tweet them. You can pick them up from each other. Um, having feeds on your feed reader is a great way to keep in touch. Lots of people write fairly short blog posts regularly. You probably don't want to read all of them. But having a site like phpdeveloper.org Planet PHP on your feed reader means you'll see quite a lot of new um, ideas, of great tutorials coming past. And if you're interested, you can dip in and read one. Um, the podcasts as well, if you, if you like to hear the audio, can be a really great way of just hearing a little bit about what's going on in the world. Uh, and there's a few regular podcast series. I enjoy them. I listen to them in the car um, or when I'm in the gym. And I just find it's a nice background way of catching up with technical news and hearing basically interviews with people talking about something they're excited in. I quite enjoy podcasts for that. So those were the free options. There's a lot of subscription services as well. Now, I don't know what you have, again, in Poland, but um, I really enjoy the PHP Architect magazine, which is relatively inexpensive, comes in. Uh, digital copy, you can get a PDF, you can get it for Kindle if you, if you have an e-reader. Um, and that's regular articles by a variety of different community people. And it tends to be very approachable, very practical. Code that you can use rather than people telling you how great they are. You know, it's, it's real, it's hands-on. Uh, and so I enjoy that. And there's lots of things like it. There's a Carsonified have a treehouse membership which has, lots of, again, lots of screencasts and videos. And if you pay for membership, you have access to all their content. And so you can keep learning and so on. I'm seeing increasing numbers of virtual training courses popping up that you can just pay. They're inexpensive, $30, something like that. So you can just sort of consume those when you're ready to learn that thing, if it suits your learning style. Books are an obvious one. They're relatively inexpensive. They go on the, the bookshelf in the office. Uh, and you can all take a turn reading them, uh, and so on. There's still um, the dead wood format. I still find it valuable. I have a whole shelf of textbooks, and it's not unusual for me to be pulling one off the shelf. This week, it was the Zen Framework in Action book. I was doing some development for somebody, and I do use Zen Framework, but not obviously the right bits. I was quite confused. But I have the book, and it was easy to look stuff up, uh, which was great. While I'm on the topic of books, something quite special happened when I arrived here on Friday. Um, I was sat about there, um, listening to one of the talks, and I suddenly realized on my Twitter stream, 
my name's getting mentioned, and you know Twitter shortens the links. So I'm really, <laughs> what have I done? Uh, and I clicked through, uh, and I've been working on a book recently, and they had released the digital version. I know what the cover looks like, uh, and it all got released just a couple of days ago. Was, if you saw me bouncing about on Friday, that's what that was. I was very, very excited. Um, so if you're looking for a good textbook, um, I <laughs> I'd like to recommend a really excellent one here. I, I can't take all the credit myself. I've got some co-authors. You've probably heard of uh, David Shafiq uh, and Matt Turnan. They're both very well known uh, in, the, in the community. But yes, this has OOP, APIs, databases, performance, security, design patterns, and probably some other stuff in it. So well worth a read if any of those are interesting. Uh, books, yeah, some other things. Training, formal training courses. I do quite a lot of training, and I do lots of different formats. So um, there's a Zen training partner in my, in my local city. It's like two miles from my house, and they are the only Zen classroom training company in the UK, which is brilliant. So I teach for them quite often, and I enjoy that. What I enjoy even more is teaching my own courses. So I really like, especially if I've gone to a team and I've met them and I've done the skills analysis, then I'm preparing training for them. Um, that's really special. You're really able to give something. And I think training is relatively inexpensive. If you have developers in-house, you need about four or five to make it really financially worth it. If you only have a few developers or if they don't all need the same training course, um, you need to look for a public course, and that will um, make more financial sense. Um, but training courses, you know, you can just do a day or two on a specific topic, and that can really help to fill in the skills gap. Sometimes it's hard to learn things by self-study, and so letting someone who's had the experience of teaching that thing a few times have a go at teaching you, um, I think can be, can be really, really beneficial. And I do see people on my training courses who've paid for their own training course. Particularly, um, I teach certification. So trying to get themselves certified so they go and get a better job where they might you know, invest in them and get them to have some training courses. I see that quite a bit. I also deliver virtual training. So if you aren't able to get to a particular um, place, or it can be quite expensive by the time you've paid for the training, for the travel, for the hotel, and so on. Um, Quite a few different companies now offer virtual training, so you're going to log in at the same time every day and do that. You buy certification training from Zend in English. You may get me. Okay, what else? Nobody in that team currently uses the tool. So that's my opportunity to go in, set them up, help them avoid the pitfall, uh, the dragons around the corner, and all the things that can go wrong when you're using a new tool for the first time. Then I teach them how to use it, we, we, do a, we agree what the process is, we write some documentation, and I go away, hoping never to hear from them again. <laughs> um, some consultants like to come and write you an expensive report every month, and every report recommends that they write you an expensive report next month. Um, I don't want to come back and see you again, do you know? <laughs> it's like that. That was awesome. I have, you know, here you are, I have given you something, and I'm done. Yeah, I'm going to go and do something else interesting. You have the tool that you need. Everybody's happy. Um, and for me, that's consultancy. It's if you don't have a senior developer, if I do a lot of recruiting senior developers for teams that seem to have carelessly lost theirs. Um, if your senior developer is too busy, this is the problem. It's not often I go into organizations where the knowledge is in-house, but they simply cannot free up that person or those people to do whatever it is I've gone in to do. So it's sort of you know, rent, a, rent a coder. <laughs> Let me pop in and help. And that's how I see consultancy, as just being a bit of extra high-level resource to get over some of the bumps in the road. I have events on this list, but I don't know why. Because when I'm at a conference, obviously, you know events are fantastic. Even if you're at your first conference, I'm confident you've seen some really good talks in the last couple of days. Um, and you know that events will teach you new technologies, but also let you rub shoulders with the people giving the talks. Chatting to the speakers in the bar is a really, really good way of exchanging ideas, being able to pick brains. I love being asked questions when I go to conferences. 
and you can also all exchange ideas with each other. It's very valuable. It's also a very quick way to get lots and lots of content into quite a small, quite a small unit of time. You've only been here a couple of days. You've seen talks on all kinds of different topics. Finally, I want to mention something that I hardly ever see used. I used to work for a company who had a training budget of precisely zero pounds. Now, what was interesting about that was, it was a training budget. It was, we agree that you must have training. We have no money for it. But every developer in that company was given one day every month to study a topic of their choice. Well, not really their choice. We would sit down quarterly and be, I think you should do this and this next. You know, I need to work on this. And so you get a whole day, um, pull a book from the company bookshelf, um, get a little bit of time with the research and development guys to kind of get you started uh, on a particular module of the application. Or perhaps the other thing we used to do is we used to take small tasks for sort of client customization and give you lots of time to do it um, as a way of having a study day, learning to, to do that particular kind of customization. Now, this doesn't cost the company a lot in terms of money, but Time is also money. And they made a huge commitment to all of us as developers to allow us to spend time training ourselves. Uh, and I found that a really, it was a small company. They didn't have a lot of money. And I found that was a really great way of, particularly for the junior developers who have all this aptitude and just haven't had time to see everything, try everything yet. I love this as a strategy. I think it's a really good thing to do. When I went, um, when I became an independent consultant, I left my day job about 15 months ago. I have regular repeating study days in my calendar. And on those days, I play with technology. Not for any rhyme or reason, not for a client, not because I'm going to need it, because I'm interested. Um, I, I, one of the things I was interested in was um, working with the Google Analytics stuff. I'm big into Google's APIs. I do a lot of work with APIs, data sets, and so on. And between the Google Analytics data sets and the Google Charts API, I was taking some stats and putting them together in lots of different ways. Um, and a friend of mine persuaded me to turn that into a product. So now I have a product out that is purely built off play time. Um, and, it's, and it's something that I'm really excited about. So building this kind of time into your schedule is very valuable, especially if you make the most of it. But also, because it doesn't cost money, yes, you, it costs in schedule terms. But it does make it easier to sell the business. Whether your training budget is zero pounds, um, or whether it's measured in time, whether it's tiny, one person can attend one conference per year, and a different person goes every year. It's really important that your organization has some kind of recognition that we all need training. Technology moves on. We need to adapt to keep up, and they need to support that. When you need to make those requests, again, we're talking to business people. They don't understand very many different ideas. They don't understand long words. As developers, we know why we need to be more awesome at what we do. We know why we need to keep meeting people, exchanging ideas, evolving. Business people don't understand why you can't be at your desk earning more money for them. Um, and so the way that you approach that is quite important. The most important thing is only ask for things that you can do really well with. Right? Your team, your organization needs you to make wise decisions here and to make requests for things where the benefit is very relevant to the work that you're actually doing. And there are two particular um, approaches which I like for justifying cost for this kind of thing. The first thing is cost-benefit analysis. Um, this is not my favorite, but it's quite a well-known and well-documented approach. What you do is you take two outcomes. One where you do invest whatever it is you've asked for, and one where you don't. 
then you make up some numbers to prove that when you do get the thing that you asked for, you therefore make more profit or save more money for the company than the other outcome. So the cost of not sending someone on a training course to work out um, how to do automated deployment means that every time we deploy, we lose two days' work and every now and again we nuke the server completely. If we do this course, which costs X amount, it'll be automated, so it'll take us one hour each time and therefore save us a couple of days every single time we do it. So then you sit down and say, well, we deploy on average five times a month, so uh, if you take this money, which saves us this much in return every time, and this option where we don't do it, this is where the numbers cross over, you will see that in seven months we will be giving the company a profit. That's really important. Business people understand those words, the numbers, and as developers, this makes no sense. <laughs> but when you need to make the business case, you need to pull in these arguments. Return on investment, right, is you invest something and you get something in return. The investment is easy to measure. It's a day out of the office and the cost of the training course. The return is quite difficult to measure. Uh, and so sometimes you can end up kind of making up numbers, um, which is exactly how business and marketing works. But we like to be accurate, so it's sort of hard for us as developers. Looking at what the return will be, we will have that knowledge in the team. We will be able to perform this much better. We're sending someone to a conference. They will learn a great many things. And so the return for that person who attends that training course, takes that study day, attends that conference, is, is significant. And you have to find a way to put that across. Sharing is the bonus multiplier. Without any more investment, you make your return bigger. We share the knowledge across the team. So one person gets, goes and does the thing, gets the, gets the benefit. And then we share it across the whole team. It's not, oh, that person's been on the training course, ask them. You're all going to share it. You're all going to talk about it. <laughs> and when you start to do this, some interesting things happen. right? You end up working in a team who are interested in technology, they talk about technology, and they learn about technology. So all of a sudden, those people that you have been working with are becoming more and more interesting to talk to, technically. They're all learning different things and sharing those things with you. You're talking about technology as a team. Um, I have some favorite ways of sharing um, ideas between a team. Uh, one of my favorites is conference slide karaoke. Take one slide deck that you have seen this weekend, take it home. Most of the speakers will publish their slides online. They will claim their talks on Joined In, and you will find all the links there. So you just go Joined In, you find the slides. Take the slides, sit down with your team, put the slides on the screen, uh, walk through the slides, and tell them what you saw. You won't be as good as the expert that gave the talk originally, but you are giving what you took from it to your peers. You're sharing what you learned. And you may not have understood all of it, but odds on, you did remember something. And as you, as you do this, as you stand in front of the slides, you must understand those ideas quite deeply to be able to explain them to somebody else. That exercise of trying to explain something to somebody else makes you understand it much better. And now our return is getting bigger and bigger. This works quite well with monthly developer lunch. I like to do this immediately before payday. <laughs> I find people are quite happy to show up and get fed when they're running out of money. Um, I think it's a fair exchange to lose your lunch break one day a month in return for food. We'll work for food, yes. <laughs> And in that, in that developer lunch, you will take the developers into the room. You will bring food. It doesn't have to be pizza. <laughs> and, and you will shut the door, OK? No managers, no interference, no project managers. This is just you guys, OK? And you are going to do conference-side karaoke. 
somebody's going to give a talk about something. You might have an agenda to discuss particular technical items that have come up in the team in an open environment to push those ideas around, try things out, and not in a way that the sales guy will be like, oh, yeah, let's do that. You can do it tomorrow, right? Because they're not going to hear that. It's just the developers. Another way that I really like to share ideas is with something called Link Tuesday. Now, I invented this completely by accident. Um, when I first gave this talk, my, my suggestion was that every single person in a team should send one interesting technical link to every other person in their team on a Tuesday. So every Tuesday, after you've spent all week with this link open in your tab, ready, so that you... Oh, it's Tuesday, I've got to be intelligent, oh dear. Um, you will receive one interesting technical link from everybody else in your team, and you will start to learn what those people are interested in, which sites they're reading, where they're getting their technical information from. And everybody's reading about all these different stuff, and you're sending things around. So that was my suggestion, that you should do this ins inside a team by email. A few weeks later, I realized that this Link Tuesday hashtag was showing up in my Twitter stream. Really? OK. And I had to look, and people were tweeting interesting links on a Tuesday with the Link Tuesday hashtag. <coughs> so that's, that's been going on at exactly a year. It's a year since I gave this talk the first time. And so much, every single week, there's been at least a couple of links with this Link Tuesday hashtag. So much so that a good friend of mine, Stefan Kotmaschka, has built this linktuesday.com, which sort of pulls all the links in from Twitter and shows you which ones were retweeted a lot, were very popular, um, what else, and what's new this week, and so on. So however you decide to adopt this, this idea of, that's an interesting article, I'm going to share it, is really important. Learning is a development process. When we design a development process, we lay down the rules and we follow them. We will not edit code on the live server. Yeah, We're going to deploy it. If you edit live, you're going to lose it next time we deploy. You can't work around those rules because the tools are in place. Learning is a development process. Decide what the big picture is. Is your team doing Link Tuesday? Are you going to ask for study days? Um, are you going to try to get some, of, some training for your team? Decide what the big picture is and follow the process. Don't agree that you're doing Link Tuesday and then never do it. Once you've got your business people to agree to study days, make sure you get them. Defend what you can get. I'm sure I'm not the only person in the room who works on their own. I run my own business, so I don't actually have a team. I kind of do. It's sort of the wider PHP community. Um, and that's the best advice I can give you. Make a team. If you know people from a user group or if you're using a co-working space, send links to those people. Find other geeky people in your co-working space. Take them for coffee. Tell them about new technologies. See if they will start sending you links in response. You make your own peer group, but you only do that when you start sharing your own ideas and reaching out. Whether you're in a team or on your own, reaching out is how this is going to happen. Change comes from you. Leadership is not the guy with the, with the job title. It's not about being in charge. It's about leading the way. It's about believing in something. It's about making things happen. And that might mean you are the only person sending a link on a Tuesday for the next four months. But one day, someone will send you back, and your team culture will start to change. Sometimes you'll be paying for your own conference tickets, taking time off work. We've all been there. But then you'll meet people and learn things and move on. I think that's really, really important. It's about sustainable learning. It's about learning how to build things up yourself, learning how to carve out the time to allow you to study, learning how to meet people, get to user groups. Um, normally, I give technical talks. And so then I'm giving you a fish, right? Oh, here, this is how you do this thing. Um, so teaching you to fish, how to go out and find the talks, to find videos of talks for conferences you weren't able to attend. Reading the articles that are out there, 
clicking the links that come up in your Twitter feed or on your, on your RSS reader. That's really, really important. And once you can do that, once you are more open to what's happening outside of your immediate surroundings, you're picking things up. You're reaching things for yourself. You're, you're able to grow your own skills. Your team's skills chart will change shape, but you will change shape too. You're challenging yourself to step up into those positions, to improve the things you already know, and to learn new things. Now you can finish. Thank you. Does anyone have any questions? Yeah. Hi. Oh, yeah. I have a question about that uh, that table with ratings. Yes. Uh, do you that ratings are absolute or relative? So, uh, let's say Zen Framework Five is five for the best people in the company, or the comparing to Matthew, where you're finding. That's a good question. Um, so, <coughs> the way that I usually do it is kind of I have a set of criteria. If I'm asking the questions, I've seen lots of teams, so it'll usually be corrected for how good I think they are in relation to other people that I meet. Within your team, you probably, w it'll be the best person gets five. Uh, and then you'll, you'll scale it down from there. Because it's really hard to measure it accurately otherwise. I had another question down here. I got a question about Link Tuesday. Uh, you sent a link to each member of your team. And what are you doing after that? Are you testing uh, some results or do nothing and wait? No, you do nothing. So what you do, you find an interesting link on the, on the internet, an article about something, you send it round. They can read it or not read it, depending whether they are the kind of people who want to know new things or not. You probably work with some of each. OK, thanks. Oh, right at the back. That's it. We have one at the back, one at the front, one at the back. One at the front. We have to keep running. You said that instead of hiring new people, we should show them how they should you know, how they can improve their skills and so yeah. on. But from the manager perspective, I can say, how can you fill the time gap? What again? if there is a lot of work and and you can't just do the job by showing people by 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 l teaching people other things? Yeah. Sometimes if you have too much work, you will need to recruit. Um, but s just because you're missing a particular skill you may not have to. If you have too much work, yes, you need more people. There isn't a way around that. But you could get um, junior people and show them things and not pay them anymore. That works. OK, and just a comment. You know, in in I got a feeling that in your presentation, you, you pres I think you've chosen the, the wrong context okay. to present, to show your arguments, which I think they're right in terms of improving skills and so on, and presenting different methods of doing that. But from from the pro uh, developer perspective, I'm not a programmer, but it looks like you know you you are presenting a solution for filling the gaps that force developers to learn more, more, and more to fulfill the gap. But I don't think that's really realistic, because you might lose another people if you do it. That's my perspective as a manager. Yeah, the talk is very much aimed at developers, and I would like all of the developers to feel more empowered. To, gr to learn more things. We're interested in new things. We're interested in getting better, but sometimes we don't know how to, and that's why I gave this talk. Uh, and what do you think about the risk that if your team skills will grow up, uh, that the members of the team will go to another company that is paying better than your company? So that investing in people is not always good from the manager point of view, yeah? Well. <laughs> So the risk, the thing is, you have, two, you, you have a choice between two risks. One is that you build a fantastic team. They're really good, and they get jobs elsewhere. The other is that you don't, and your team is not really good. Which one do you want? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's tricky. OK, so um, this is me. This is me on Twitter. This is, this is my site. Hopefully you know what this top link is with joined in. 
Um, it's an event feedback site. If you liked this talk, or perhaps more importantly, if there was something you didn't like, you will go here and you will tell me. Um, it's a way for you to give feedback for all of the speakers. It's an open source project, so if you don't like it, fix it. Um, I am the project lead, feel free to argue with me about that. All of the speakers that you have seen this weekend spend a lot of time preparing their talks, and I don't think it's too much for you to go here and leave a few words for them about what works and what doesn't. So thanks for that.